You also talk about clearly that diets don't work because they trick your body into thinking you're living in a time of famine and they make it want to be fatter. You talk about toxins, radiation, yo-yo dieting, food additives, fear of scarcity, emotional obesity, mental starvation, and devitalization, which I thought was interesting. Talk about devitalization because we know from the work of Dr. Batman G that a lot of the times the body is hungry, it's really thirsty. And as you put in your book and others have referenced, many people don't drink enough water in a day's time. But talk about the devitalization, what you mean by that, why it's so important. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, again, if you look at thousands of years ago, most of the food we ate had, had life force in it. I mean, salads, plants, it's basically it's captured sunlight. It's life force energy. It's live. And even though we can't measure life, we all know there's a difference between something that's alive and something that's dead. And that difference is life force energy. You know, with what Ch in Chinese medicine, what they refer to as qi or Ayurvedic medicine is, as prana. It, it's, it's a life force vitality, and it's only in live food. And it used to be most of the food we ate was live. And now, none of the food that we eat is live. And we are constantly, are constantly devitalized, constantly exhausted. We live in, we spend most of our time indoors, away from sunlight and nature. And all the, and, and sunlight and nature ha has its own specific type of life force energy. And we absorb all that through our food and through being outdoors. And now we're not. And that's a stress. And that stress, that, that chronic stress is going to cause that same type of cortisol type of thing. It's like you need something, but you don't know what you need. And the problem is, you can't really prove it because there's no way to measure life force. Or at least there isn't. But there is, there's, there's a lot of current, there's some sort of research that's coming out now that talks about biophotons. Right, right. Biophotons bio are light photons that are emitted from live food that actually go from the, from the food into your DNA. There's a whole science about this, isn't there, on biophoton yeah, science? It's an emerging science, an emerging science. And they say that the more biophotons there are, the more, uh, and the more it organizes or it, it has a, a beneficial effect somehow on your cells. They don't really know just yet, but to me it's just common sense. And I'm not really going to sit around and wait for um, science to put, put their stamp of approval on it and say, yes, there's a life force energy. I know there's a life force energy. And I know that life force energy is in, is in food that's live. I can feel it. I can tell. And when I eat more live food, I, have, I feel a level of satisfaction in my body and energy in my body that I don't get from any type of food, even superfoods that are powdered. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting what you're saying. When you were in the 400-pound level, did you ever feel you would never take it off? Yeah, I, well, I kind of did come to that place. That was sort of a turning point for me where I sort of came to this place where I had always thought I was going to lose it, and then I said, you know what, maybe I'm going to live the rest of my life like this. And, I, and that was right around when I said I'm not going to diet anymore. I said, you know what, I'm dieting. Every time I diet, I'm always, I'm always heavier three weeks later after the diet's over than when I even started. So I said, I'm not going to diet anymore. I just don't want to, I'm not going to try to lose the weight anymore. I'm not going to be disgusted with the weight I'm at anymore. I'm just going to give all that up. I just don't want to gain any more weight. And I did come to that place. And I think that was a really powerful place for me. Because after that, somehow things started, things started happening for me. Now, I noticed in the book, you speak to the concept of metabolism, like it's not this, it's not that, it's not just the metabolism. But don't you think metabolism is a player? 100% it's one of the players, but like I said, it's a soldier. It's not the general. Now, the, ge the general, really, if you look at it, it's the part of your brain, that the hypothalamus or the animal brain, has, has cer a certain area in it that has receptors for the hormone leptin. And this is really what controls things. When your body wants to, wants to hold up the weight, wants to shift its set point, that part of your brain will become less sensitive to the hormone leptin. When that happens, a lot of things, uh, there's a whole cascade of things that happen, but one of them is your metabolism slows down. Your thyroid actually becomes less active and your, and your metabolism slows down. That's because we, there's a whole downstream level of signaling that takes place from your hypothalamus to your, to your thyroid, to your liver, and to a lot of other, to your stomach and a lot of other places that doesn't happen when your body stops listening to leptin. So 
that's all that has to happen. And that's the that's the general. That that's the controlling force. How do you get that part of your brain to be more sensitive to leptin? Then it all happens automatically. Isn't that an anomaly for most of us? The, what the leptin insensitivity? Yeah. In other words, how you get leptin to work for you? How you get the hypothalamus, the general, to do its thing efficiently and effectively? Well, well that, 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 look, it's programmed to do it. Like if you were running away from tigers, guess what? Your hypothalamus is listening to leptin. <laughs> Because the chemistry that takes place from that type of stress makes your brain more sensitive to leptin. If you're in a famine, guess what? Your brain's not listening to leptin. So if you're having stress that's causing the same chemistry as a famine in your body, your brain's not listening to leptin. If you're having stress that's causing the same chemistry as you running away from a tiger, your brain's listening to leptin. Can we talk about the subconscious for a moment in the context of the hypothalamus? Yeah. The subconscious is the knower isn't it? That's where things are happening. That is below our conscious awareness. Is that correct? That's where, that's where all, of the, all of the, I would call it more of the unconscious, but where all the unconscious processes happen of determining how much air, how much oxygen you need, how much sleep you need, how fast your heart should be, how much blood you should have in your body, where your antibodies should go, how much food you should have, how fat or thin you should be. All that happens at the level of your, uh, of your unconscious. Or what, you, or what you're calling your subconscious. That's true. And so how do you think from your experience and your life and having lost all this weight and kept it off and guiding thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people around the world, what do you have to say about the unconscious and the subconscious relative to its role in keeping us fat or thin? Well, I, I would say it's in complete control. I, I would say that, that, I mean, that is really the, the general. That's, but it's based on certain programs that, is, that are in place, certain survival programs that are already in place. Like, um, it, it, it has it pretty much down that if you're in a famine, it's going to shift your set point one way. If you're running away from a tiger, it's going to shift your set point another way. It's all kind of in place. But it's also been my experience that you can kind of communicate with that unconscious. And, and visualization is a really good mechanism for doing it because it's like visualization is like, a, is like a language that you can use to communicate with your body. And I find it all the time with myself. It's, when I do visualization, like I, I visualize my ideal body and I feel like I'm communicating with that part of my brain that's in, char that's in charge. And I, and I thought about this, and I thought, well, why, why is visualization so successful for weight loss? And it's been successful for lots of people in physical, you know, Olympic athletes. Right. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger said he used to use visualization for when he did bodybuilding, and he was a, you know, champion bodybuilder. Why, why is visualization so successful? And I think it's because it's like, it, it, to me, it's like sort of like a language that you can use to communicate with that subconscious, because that subconscious doesn't speak English. You can't say to your subconscious brain, I want to lose weight uh, because I want to look good for a wedding in six months. Your subconscious knows safe and not safe. It doesn't know six months. It doesn't know wedding. It doesn't know any of these things. And, and this is sort of a problem that we all have, is that we don't really even know how to communicate with our own brains. But visualization is like the same thing. as like if you were in a foreign country and no one speaks your language, and you had to go to the bathroom, you could ask a thousand people where the bathroom is and no one would be able to tell you. But if you simply draw a picture of a bathroom and show it to anybody, instantly they would know what you were talking about and they would say, and they would point you, anyone would. Symbols are the universal language that you use to communicate with people that don't, that don't speak the same language as you. So it's like we've got this part of our brain that we don't know how to communicate that's in complete control of so much of our health including our weight and we don't know how to talk to it but when you use visualization it's like you're talking to it you're saying you're getting the stress wrong we don't need the weight this is the ideal weight that we need for to, in order to survive the, the life that we're in the environment that we're in and your body understands that and for me it was really powerful because when, when I weighed over 400 pounds I had a very vivid image of the way I wanted to look and every night as I went to sleep, I would have that image. And one day, I became exactly that image. I don't know if you've seen, uh, you know, my before and after pictures. I am looking at them right now. I want to know who's the original man because it doesn't look like you. <laughs> it doesn't look like you. I can't even. It is. It was me, and it's a, it's a huge difference. And I really think that visualization played a strong part in that. When did visualization become integral in your life?